Okay, so this week we are talking about branching and really what we're talking about are decisions. In Python, well in any programming language, we have to learn to make decisions because that's really the heart and soul of programming. Um, you just right now we can create variables, we can add things, we can subtract things, we can print stuff out to the screen, we can get stuff from the screen, but that's all we can do. And while that's great for where we are, we want to get considerably further. The bread and butter of a programmer is understanding how to think logically and uh, have the computer make decisions that um, are going to impact the processing portion of the input process output. So first a bit of background. Um, understanding how to program Python to make decisions is the first part of writing an algorithm. And algorithms are important. That's really what you do as a computer programmer. And an algorithm is just a, a procedure, so a set of statements in Python that solve a problem computationally with the Python language. And, and think about that as the game due in week seven. So we're, we're, from now on, we're really talking about, well, through module six, we are really talking about how to write and structure algorithms. Seven goes into data storage and file processing, and eight allows us to start into object-oriented programming, which is another way to organize your data. Um, but here's where we have to start, and you need to understand how to ask Python a question so that you get the answer that you, you would be expecting. So we got some new keywords. And there is an order to how you use these keywords. If, if tells Python, hey Python, you're going to have to answer a question. And you always see an if statement first because you can ask follow-on questions. Two through however many is L if. L if is the keyword. It's saying, okay, Python, make another decision, but it's mutually exclusive, and we'll explain what mutual exclusivity is in a minute, it's mutually exclusive from the if statement. And then there is the last, which is else. L says, if nothing else happens in this chain of questions, then do this. So if, L, if, and else, you will always see it in this order if you have all three. You can you only have to have an if, but you always have to have an if. You don't have to have an L if and you don't have to have an else. But there are definitely times when you will need to use those. Okay. We also get into this whole new thing called relational operators. We know what an assignment is. We know that you use the single equal sign to assign a value to a variable. Now we're starting to get into double operators. You have a, an equal equal sign, you have a not equal to, a less than, a less than or equal to, greater than or greater than or equal to. Well, these aren't necessarily mathematical. What we are doing is we are looking for a relationship. So there's going to be something on the left-hand side of that equal equal sign and on the right-hand side of that equal equal sign. And we are saying, are the two equivalent? We're not doing assignment. We're not moving anything into a variable. We're asking a question. OK. Um, we also have something called Boolean operators. The new type that we're dealing with here is Boolean. And you have operators that allow you to combine decisions. Is the sky blue and is it sunny? And is the operator there? Um, and basically an and is 
all relational statements have to be true for the compound statement to be true or is only one of the statements have to be true and not is just the opposite. So not and or not or. I don't use not very much, but it is there and it's something we should understand. Okay, so we now have something called Boolean values. Now I mentioned these before when we were first talking about variable types and I said we'll get to Booleans in module three. There are, well, let me, let me uh, start back, oops, sorry. Computers are stupid. I get, when I tell this to people and I'm actually face to face with them, I get, I get look like I have, I have three heads. But the truth of the matter is computers can only make one of two decisions, true or false. That's it. That's all we've got. That's all we've ever had when it comes to computers. They are binary machines and they only know two things, true or false. It's like a light switch, not even a dimmer switch. You can turn the light switch on, you can turn the light switch off, but you can't do anything else. So what we have to do as programmers is learn to tell Python to make a decision in a way that it can come out with an answer that's true or false. Because Python can't understand, is the sky blue? Python doesn't know what that is. So we'll go back to that in a second. Sorry, got a little ahead of myself. So we don't really start talking about scope until we talk about functions. But I think it's more important right now to talk about scope. Because scope is important in how you are structuring your if statements. Um, so what is scope? Scope dictates when a, uh, when a line of code is available to execute. Now, so far, we've always executed all lines of code. In this, starting this week, we will not always execute all lines of code. They will be put in scopes that may or may not be executed. An example of a line of code that could be executed is a variable. When you first define a variable, you right now, every time we define a variable, the whole script has the option to get the variable. Um, that won't always be the case starting this week. There may be times when we define a variable in a local scope, and that variable is not going to be available to the global scope. So we have three types of scopes and only two that we really care about. We have the global scope, which is what we have worked with so far. Module one and module two, we only ever had the global scope. Now we have something called the local scope. The local scope is defined inside of a class, function, loop, or branch. We're doing branching this week, so we're gonna be dealing with a local scope. And local scope is what is inside that branch, what's underneath the if statement. And there is something called built-in, it's defined by Python, but it's not something that we ever have to worry about. Okay, syntax formatting and scope. Now, if you wanna read along, this is challenge 3.2.2. So what do we have here? Well, we know what user age equals int input is. We're getting input from a user, we're expecting it to be an integer and we are assigning that value to a variable called user age. We know it's a variable because it is on the left hand side of a single equal sign. And by the way, this is the last week I'm gonna keep repeating that particular one uh, because I pro it's probably old and ever, everybody probably understands that by now. So now we have two different things. We have this if and this else statement. And all of a sudden we also have these print statements, but they're not left justified. Everything we've done up till now, everything's always started on the, the leftmost character in our code, in our Python, in our Zybooks. But now we have, um, we have statements that are indented. And remember back in module one when I said cases and spaces matter. This is where the spaces really matter 
because we're introducing local scope. So what I have here is everything in blue is what is the global scope. So that means everything in Python could get to it. Doesn't matter. And then I have these two new things called the local scope. So we will notice that we have this if statement. And the if statement is user, the if statement can be read. Is user age, sorry, let me go back. The um, if statement can be read, user age is less than 18, true or false. Every if statement, every else, every LS statement can be read as a true false question like you used to get in high school. Um, what's in orange here is the stuff in the local scope. Local scope means it will only ever be executed if the decision above it, the branch above it, uh, evaluates to true. So that's just a visual way to look. And when we start getting into actually doing some of this in PyCharm tonight, you will see how things act when they are in the local scope. Okay, so if and else are our new keywords, um, and they tell Python that it is time to make a decision. The user age statement reads, user age is less than 18, true or false. You got to have the colon. Without that colon, Python doesn't know where to stop asking the question. It is like adding a question mark at the end of the sentence. Um, rule number one, it's only in the local scope if it's indented. Rule number two, a statement is a variable followed by a Boolean operator followed by a variable or value. So this statement user underscore age less than 18 has a variable named user underscore age which in which a value has been assigned because that's where the input statement was the boolean operator is less than and the value that it's being checked against is 18. so the statement is the variable user age followed by the boolean op operator less than and then followed by the value 18. So computers aren't smart and neither are computer programming languages. And I think that's something that shocks people sometimes. So here's just a quick example. If I ask the question, am I young? Python's going to go, huh? What, what in the world are you talking about? Python doesn't know how to speak English, so we have to learn to speak Python. How to ask a question. It is really all a true or false test. Because that's the only thing that Python can answer. So if I say, am I young, Python's going to go, well, I have no clue. So how do I ask this, Python, this question in Python? One of the things I have to do is I have to define what young means. Young is a beautiful thing. I know people who are 90 who consider themselves young. And I know people who are 10 who consider them, you know, well, yeah. I know people who are, who everybody would consider young, like a child. So how do I do that? Well, I'm not going to have my user age again, and that's my test variable. That variable is going to have a value, and it will have been defined and assigned before I use my if statement. Now I'm going to use that test variable in my decision making. Um, the if statement has two possible outcomes, true or false. And so what I have defined is I have defined young as less than or equal to 18. That's what that line did. And when I, when the user age is less than or equal to 18, I will then print 18 or less. Otherwise, I will print over 18. So 
else is related to if and if user age less than or equal to 18 evaluates to false, it's going to not execute print 18 or less. It's going to execute print 18 or over. So let's take a quick look at 3. Point, what is that? 3.2.2.2. Wait a minute. Did I open the wrong one? Sorry about that. I opened the wrong one. Give me just a second uh, to open the right one. Where am I? That's why. Okay. Uh, Python module three. Okay. So, uh, here is our age. Okay. And what they want you to do here in the challenge is write an expression that will cause the following to print 18 or less if the value of user age is 18 or less. Write only the expression. So here I have my input statement. We know what this is. We've done this for two weeks. Um, what I have is I have, and I've just defined a little bit of my terminology here. The left-hand side is what is on the left of the Boolean operator. The right hand side is what is to the right of the Boolean operator. So when I talk about left hand side, it's to the left of the Boolean operator and right hand side, it's to the right of the Boolean operator. And what I just have this little simple statement here. Now a few things to note. Lines 12 and 14 are indented. Lines 11 and 13 are not. 11 and 13 are left justified. That's just the terminology. So let's do this and I will edit the configuration. And where is it? 3.2.2? Yeah. I don't know why these never come out. Okay. So I'm going to debug this and I want to show you real quick what it does. So I'm in the debugger and I'm on the console. Um, it's waiting for user age so I'm going to give it 42. Now I am on line 11. So I didn't stop it here because I didn't think we needed to but now it has stopped at line 11. If I go in and I look at my variables I have user age equals 42. So let's at, let's before we do this in Python, let's think about it as a true false question. User age is less than or equal to 18. In this case, because user age is 42, I will say 42 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. That's false. So let's see what happens. Will it go to line 12 or will it not? If I step over line 11, it goes straight to line 14. Why did it do that? Well, first of all, 42 is 42, uh, sorry, 42 is less than or equal to 18 is a false statement. So it's never going to hit line 12 when user age is 42. So the next thing Python is going to do is say, well, what do I do now? And if there's an else and an if, because these two are related, um, then it will say, okay, there's an else, which means if nothing else associated with that if statement is true, then do, what, do what's here. And so we're going to print over 18. So I wanted to, to mention just for a second that these are related, okay? You can't have an, F, an if without an else. Sorry, yeah, you can't have, sorry, backwards. You cannot have an else without an if. And to show you that, I'm just going to comment these two guys out. Let's see what happens. Whoops, sorry, wrong language. All right, let's just see what this happens. I've just made line 11 and 12 comments. 
So I've got, still got my else here, but I've got this nasty red squiggly, and it says statement expected, found pi else underscore keyword, and I found a colon. So let's just run this for a second and see what Python tells me. What Python tells me is I have a syntax error, invalid syntax, at line 13. Now, this isn't hugely helpful, um, but... We do know if, if you are simply looking at line 13, sorry, line 13, you're going to say, hey, wait a minute, I remember the colon. Else is a valid keyword, and I remember the colon. Why is it telling me that there's invalid syntax? That's because the if statement and the else statement have to be related. I cannot have an else statement without an if. The converse isn't true. I can have an if without an else, and I'll show you that in a second. So the way to get rid of that is to make sure you have an if statement. So now, whoops, hold on. Things have to be, there we go. Now everything's back in balance, and I can run this, and I can type 42. Whoops, my bad. Okay. And then undo, let's see. Stop it. Okay, let's start it. Put my cursor in the right place, says 42, and over 18. Now, um, I'm going to do something else to break this. So, I just took line 12, and I backspace, so it's no longer tabbed in once. There is no indent. The if statement, the print st and the print statement are left justified. They are the same place. They're right along that line. Now, I've got a nasty little squiggly from PyCharm, and it says indent ex expected. And if I try and run it, it will say indentationary expected an indented block. That is because you cannot have an if statement without something for Python to do. If assuming if um, evaluates to true. And even if this did work, it would be a logic error. Because what I'm telling Python is print 18 or less is in the global scope. And it cannot be in the global scope because it is, the, it is underneath an if statement. So if I tab that in, everything is fine. Now, the converse here of the true-false test is simply that if doesn't require an else. You don't have to have an else with an if. It, this will still run just fine. So now, let's talk about else for a second. I'm going to uncomment our else. And what happens if I put in a different number? So I'm going to debug this. It's waiting for me to add a number into the console. I'm going to say 10. So we know that user age is 10. It's right there. If I step over, well, let's, let's think about it for a minute. 10 is less than or 18, true or false. This will evaluate to true because 10 is less than or equal to 18. So I'm going to step over. It's going to print 18 or less now. And that's what it does on the console, and then it finishes. So that is the relationship between if and else. And under, I'm hoping everybody understands that these are local scope. And you have to have them. They have to, you cannot have an if statement without something in its local scope. Now, um, if I had two lines here, let's just say I had to print another line. And I run it, I'm going to give it, 10, and I get 18 or less and another line. Okay, so now I have two lines in my local scope for that if statement. 
that's all fine and good, but what if I forget to indent this? Well, it's nice because I don't get the, the problem with this print statement, which says there was an indentation error, but I have my red squigglies down here in else. So if I run it, I'm going to say syntax error, invalid syntax. Well, this is one of those things that could drive you crazy because, hey, wait a minute, I have invalid syntax, but I know that else is the right keyword, I've spelled it correctly, and I've ended it with a colon. Why in the world is there invalid syntax? That is because else and if are related. You cannot have something in the global scope between an if and an else. And that's what's happening right here. This print statement, because it is left justified, is in the global scope. So I've broken up the flow of that if-else statement, and Python says, I can't help you here. I can't do anything. So you have to have that print statement and any other lines that you want to execute in the local scope for either the if, the else, or the lf. So let's keep going. I think I'm being a, long -winded to, a little long-winded tonight. I hope it's not too bad. So we're going to use the flowchart as a tool just really quick to do this visually. Um, and by the way, you're going to have to do flowcharts. There is something called Lucidchart, which is completely free. The school recommends that you use it. And um, you can do all of your flowcharts in it, and it's for free, and you can download them as an image. So. What do I have here in my flowchart? I have my user age. I've just put in 21. I have a diamond. That diamond represents in a flowchart a decision. And the decision will be user age less than or equal to 18. If it's true, hold on, let me redo this because it's just going too fast. So I have do this again and hopefully it won't go too fast. Um, so we have our start, we have our user input which is age, we now have our diamond which is the decision. There are two options for this decision, true or false. False is you print over 18, true is you print 18 or less, and then we're done. Either way. So what you see here, false, this is what an else looks like. On the left, true, that is what an if statement looks like. So if Professor Lisa is testing your code and she types in 21, user age less than or equal to 18, evaluates to false, everything else goes away. Python doesn't care about anything else and it's going to print over 18. So now Professor, Le Professor Lisa, where is she? There she goes. She enters 10. 10 is less than or equal to 18. That is a true statement. So Python's going to ignore everything else and go down the, the true path. Okay. One more decision maker. Elif. Okay. If I say, well, am I middle-aged? I wanted to know if I was young before. Now I want to know if I'm middle-aged. So I have user age equals int input. We've seen this before. I have my if user age is less than or equal to 18. I'm going to print 18 or less. So now I am using something called elif. And an elif can be after an if statement, but it has to be before an else statement. Again, there's a relationship, and that relationship has to have a flow. So the L if statement is L if user underscore age less than 50. Now what relates these, this if and this LF, L if? What relates it is the test variable. What relates them is user age. So the first one I'm going to test user age, and okay, it evaluated defaults. So it's going to go to L if, and it's going to test user age again. And this time it's going to say, is it value less than or equal to 50. And then we have our else statement, which is, if all else fails, nope, you're old. 
So this is the flow when you have an ELIF statement. Again, it's if, ELIF, and else. And let's look at the middle age flow chart, and then we'll just do a little bit of looking at the program itself. So now I have my user input. I have my if statement that I had before. I can evaluate to true or false. Assuming that that first if statement evaluates to false, I now have another decision to make. That's the other diamond. That diamond itself can evaluate to true or false. And then eventually, when everything is looked at, the program ends. And that's what an else looks like. And the elif happens in a second diamond. So these are related. One, if the decision, the decision of the if statement will affect whether or not Python even Bob looks at the if sta at the elif statement. So if I just put in 10, user age is 10, 10 is less than or equal to 18. That's a true statement. I'm going to print over 18. Everything else went away in terms of what Python's going to do. I'm going to put 21. User age 21 is less than or equal to 18. That's false. So what's going to happen is I'm going to go down to this Ellis statement and I'm going to say uh, user underscore user age, sorry, 21 is less than 50 true or false. That is a true statement. So I'm going to print in the middle. And then I'm going to put 60. User age is now 60. User age is not less than or equal to 18. User age is not less than or equal to 50. So that is false. And I'm going to print, nope, you're old. So that's what a flow looks like for a uh, yes. OK. Is there a limit to how many ELIF statements you can put? Nope. There is not a limit. I was writing a programming language once. Yes, I used to write a, a proprietary programming language. And I think we had 110 because of all the different syntax combinations that they could have. That's an extreme example, but you can have as many LF statements as you want. Um, can I just use all if statements? How do I decide when to use LF after the first if? Very good question. It's the concept of mutual exclusivity. Let me bring up the 3.2.2 plus, and we will look at that. So what ELF and ELIF gives us is whether or not something is mutually exclusive. What does mutually exclusive mean? Mutual means there's a group. Exclusive means you only get one. So mutually exclusive will take all of these as, Python's going to look at these all as one block. Okay, They are all related because you have if, and then following an if, you have an elif, and then following that, you have an else. Or we could have another elif under here, and another elif. Um, so what decides, let me double check. I want to make sure I get the question right. OK, how do I decide when to use the elif after the first if? One of the ways you can do that is to determine hey, are you going to be evaluating the same variable? Okay, If you're evaluating the same variable, the probability is you're going to want it to be an elif rather than an if, because an if is an independent statement. There is no relationship before this if. You can't have an elif before it. An elif has to have an if before it. So by definition, those two statements are related. Why are they related? Well, because of the way that Python wrote the code. But also what's important is you see here user age is being evaluated for something. And here user age is being evaluated for something else. And if I did another elif statement, 
plus and then equal to 70. Print. Not quite old yet. So I just added another LF statement. And so I am testing user age again. So I have user age in the if statement. I have user age here as an LF statement where I am evaluating it against something different than the if statement. And I have user age here, which I'm evaluating against something different than the previous two. If you are using the same variable to do an evaluation, the general rule is you're going to use an if elif dot n and then else when all your elifs are done. So does that help answer the question? And is it Maeve? Okay. I'm good. Uh, are you if you, as long as you're good, Maeve, we'll move on. Okay. So Boolean operators. Okay, so now I've just inundated you with if, elif, and else statements. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to make things more complicated. Because I can check more than one thing in an if statement. I can check as many as I want. I've written some pretty complex if, elif, and else statements. And how the individual statements evaluate gives you your overall answer. And this can get a little, a little weird because it's different if you have and or if you have or. So and and or are Boolean operators. And is you're adding things together. Or is you're not. You're looking at them individually. So how does this work? Um, if you have an and in between two statements, both statements must evaluate to true for the entire statement to evaluate to true. If you have an or in between two statements, one of the statements has to evaluate to true for the whole thing to evaluate to true. So if we look at this first if statement here, let's just say num1 is 10, num2 is 2. So I have to take these in individual parts, which is why we have the blue box, the, the little brown boxes around them. So I have if num1 is equal to 10, stop there. Just stop. Don't go to the and. We're going to stop here, and we're going to evaluate. Python's going to evaluate that. It's going to say, okay, what's the value of num1? The value of num1 is 10. So is 10 the same as 10 is are they are they equivalent are, are they equal to each other that's going to be true great python's now going to look at the operator in between them and it's going to say okay this is an and so i'm going to evaluate the next statement which is num2 is the same is equivalent to 2 and see what it comes to so it's going to be num2 is 2. We know that because we put that up there on the upper left corner. So num, let, let me say that as a true-false question. 2 is the same as 2, true or false. That's true. So because num is equivalent to 10 is true and num2 is equivalent to 2 is 2, we have true and true, which is true. And then if we look at a separate if statement, we're just doing it because we don't want an LF right now. If num1 is the same as 10, or num1 is the same as 10, num1 is equivalent to 10. That's true. We already knew it was true. We're happy that it's true. And num2 is less than 2, true or false. That is false because num2 is 2. That's the value of it. So I have true for the first statement and false for the second statement. True and false is always false. And by the way, Zybooks has a, a big chart in there that talks about all this. 
The opposite is true for the OR statement. If I take that same statement we just looked at, if num1 is equivalent to 10 and num2 is equivalent to 2, if I take that and remove the AND and put in an OR, and I say, if num1 is equivalent to 10, well, that's true, or num2 is less than true, well, that's false. So with an OR in the middle, the outcome of everything is true. Because what you're doing is you're taking the value, sorry, you're taking the outcome of the individual statements and you are anding them or oring them, and that's what it's called, together to get the um, value for the entire statement. So, between. You're going to have to use the concept of between in one of your labs this week. Now, between is a little bit um, tricky. Uh, it's a little tricky of a concept because what we are doing is we are looking for a range, okay? And in this example, my age is 20, and I want to know if I'm in school or not. So you will first notice, if you look at all these if, elif, and elif statements, they're all evaluating age. And furthermore, each of these if and elif statements have two statements within them. They have two tests. The first is age greater than, and the, and the first one it's age greater than, in this case zero, and age less than, in this case four. So that tells me that both of those statements have to evaluate to true for the whole thing to be true. And what does that mean? That means that it will print no school if both of them are true. And in fact, I think I'm just going to do this one through PyCharm. I think it will be easier to look at if it's in PyCharm. So let's do between. Okay. So between is just what we saw and what we have here is we have five related statements. We have an if statement, we have an elif statement, we have another elif, another elif, and then an else at the end, which is basically if none of the other stuff above me is true, then do, what's, do what line there is. So I'm going to edit the configuration real quick. And find between. I still don't know why these don't are showing up in reverse order. Anyway, so if I debug this, because we all know how much I like the debugger, if I look at my variables, I have an age of five. So I'm going to step over line five. Now, let's think about this for a minute. I have age is the value of five. 5 is greater than 0, that's true, and 5 is less than 4, that is false. So what will happen when this evaluates? If I'm going to say true and false, and by the way, see what PyCharm is doing here? If I um, mouse over the each, each statement in an if statement, it's going to tell you what the outcome already is. So true and false are false. So it is not going to execute line six. Instead, it's going to go to line seven. And now I have five is greater than or equal to four. That's true. Age is less than nine. That's true. So because true and true are true, I'm going to print elementary school, and I'm going to be done. Now, one thing to, to look for here is these, the operators, not the Boolean operators, but the actual operators are important to understand. You will see here that I have greater than zero and less than four. But on the next line, I have greater than or equal to 4. And that is because I want to include 4 as part of my decision process. 
If I just said greater than 4 here, I would not have actually gotten the number 4. So you have to be careful when you're doing the between. So let's do another real quick test. Let's say that um, I'm going to be 15. So I'm going to debug this again. And I'm going to mouse over real quick the operator between age and 0. 15 is greater than 0. True. 15 is less than 4. False. So we already know what's going to happen. I'm going to step over that. So 15 is greater than or equal to 4. True. 15 is not less than 9. So when, I'm, when I step over, it's not going to say I'm in elementary school. 15 is greater than or equal to 9, so that's true. 15 is not greater than 13, so this whole statement evaluates to false. I won't get to line 10. Now I'm on line 11, so 15 is greater than or equal to 13, yes. 15 is less than 19, that's true as well. So now I'm going to say that I'm in high school. So that is what between looks like. I am looking for the, the a verification that whatever I'm evaluating, in this case age, is between two numbers. And I'm saying that because you're going to have to use it in a lab this week. So it's important to understand that concept. Um, okay, complex questions. So this is uh, floor.py, and why are we doing floor.py? We are doing floor.py because you have to use it in one of your labs this week. We mention floor in module one, but then we don't talk anymore about it. And then in, um, in one of the labs this week, you have to use it. So um, this is just a small example that's similar to the lab. And it says, given the number 223, find how many 100s and how many 10s there are. Output a plural if more than one. Output singular or none if zero. So I just have a number 223. And I've got, I now have to do a calculation. Before I do anything else, before I ask any questions, I have to calculate. What am I calculating? Well, how many time, how many one, how many hundreds do I have in 233? Well, the way I do that is to use the floor operator. The floor operator is to backslash, slash, backslash, slash. And I'm seeing how many hundreds, so it's going to be 223. The floor operator, 100, and that will give me the number of hundreds. In this case, it'll be two. And then I'm going to calculate the remainder. Now, you cannot do this with modula, and in the lab, you cannot use the modula operator. It won't work. So here, I'm going to have num. I'm just going to change the value of num, and I'm going to say num equal num minus 100 times 100. And then I'm going to say tens is num floor 10. That's the calculation part of it. That has nothing to do with the decision part. The decision part is, first of all, I have to say, do I have any hundreds? So I do that by saying, if hundreds, sorry, yeah, do I have any hundreds? If hundreds is equivalent to zero, then I don't have any hundreds. And that's what I'm going to print out. Then I'm going to say, okay, if if I do have hundreds, I'm going to then drop to the if statement, and I'm going to have, are there more than 100s? That's hundreds greater than 1. And if that is true, I'm going to print number of hundreds is, and then I'm going to put the number of hundreds in there. Otherwise, I'm going to say there aren't any hundreds. So we can read that is hundreds equal to 0, true or false. Is hundreds greater than one, true or false? Um, none of the if or else statements return true, so I'm going to do what's underneath that. 
And then I do the same thing for tens. Are there any tens? Are there, is there only one ten? Or are there multiple tens? So, let's see. Yeah. So, it's the exact same. Are there any tens? Is ten equal to zeros? And if it's true, then I'm going to print no tens. If it's not true, then I'm going to drop to the LF statement. In the LF statement, I'm going to say, are there more than one ten? So it's tens greater than one. Tens is greater than one, true or false. If that's true, I print number of tens is, and I'm done. If that one is false, I go down to the else statement, and I print one ten. Okay, flowchart is a visual tool. And I'm just doing this here tonight to... Um, to give you a little bit more use of a flowchart, because you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to do several flowcharts for this class. So the flowchart for this is relatively straightforward, but it's also larger than we've seen before. So I have a variable num. The variable num is 223. I'm going to set hundreds equal num modulo 100. Or sorry, floor 100. I'm going to set num equal num, uh, sorry, that should have been a minus sign. And then I'm going to set tens equal num modulo 10. So now I get into my true-false. I have my first true-false question is, if hundreds is the same as zero, I'm going to output no hundreds. If that is evaluates true, the next thing I'm going to do is, if hundreds is greater than one, I'm going to put output the number of hundreds is. Otherwise, I'm just going to put there's no hundred. There, um, there's one hundred. Now, after that, I go to another if statement. So maybe this kind of goes to how do you tell the difference? I was doing all hundreds. That's what if hundreds equal and LF hundreds equal. Now I'm going to evaluate tens. So I'm going to have if an LF and an else statement to evaluate tens. So I have if tens is zero, which is true, then I'm not going to put say there aren't any tens. If tens is greater than zero, then it's going to be false. The, the diamond is going to be false. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to say, OK, do I have more than one ten? If I have more than one ten, I'm going to output the number of tens is. And if I don't, that's the else statement. And then it's going to be false. I'm just going to output 110, and then the program ends. So you can see that these rapidly can get very, very complex. Don't let the complexity to scare you. But sometimes writing something out as a flowchart might be helpful. Yes. Yes, that's for the exact change lab. You have to do the floor operator for the exact change lab. And in fact, um, I have a floor.py here, which kind of gets you started. There's floor.py. And you'll see that you know I have money is 150, hundreds is 100, quarter is uh, 25. And then I do the mod, I do the floor operator. And you have to do it like this. You don't have to print dollars and amount. But you do need to use the floor operator and not the mo modular operator and to figure out the next, the next thing in the line because um, in the 3.13 um, you're going to be doing dollars, quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies. So you're going to be doing a lot of these. Okay, so what does floor mean? Floor basically is a remainder, a whole remainder. So if I were doing division and I were dividing 110 by 100, I would get 1.10. I don't want 1.10 in this case. I want to know from a whole number perspective. I don't want a decimal point after it. So only tell me the number of times that 100 goes into 110 as a whole number, and that would be 1. And that's what the floor operator does. 
and it is different than the modulo operator and a lot of people get this problem wrong because they use the modulo operator. Does that help, Kevin? Here, and actually let me just run through this one real quick and I think that will help you see what the modular operator is. It is like segmenting. Let's do the floor and we'll see how that goes. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And of course we have to run it in the debugger. So if I look at variables, um, I'm going to have my total amount of money is $1.50. Okay, and I'm just defining hundreds and quarters because that's what I do. When, as a programmer, I don't like to have hard-coded things, and when I do, I put them into variables because if I wanted to change 100 to a different number, I would only have to change it here, and it would happen everywhere. So 100 is going to be 100, and, 20, and quarters is going to be 25. So my dollars is going to be money modula 100, sorry, floor 100. So if I do that, my money, so I have dollars is 1, and my money was 150. haven't changed money yet. So it just gives you the whole unit that is in the value. And then I'm now going to create a different amount. Amount equals money minus dollars times 100. So my amount is now 50. So I've removed any possibility of dollars from it. And now I'm just dealing with the change. And now I'm going to deal with how many quarters are in 50. So I'm going to do quarter floor, sorry, amount floor quarter. And my new amount is 50. So there are two quarters in 50. Now I'm going to go down and I'm going to have to figure out how to print things out. This is where you have to use one of those. Instead of doing print and just letting it happen, you're going to have to have a space at the end of the line. So I have print dollars, comma, end space. So if I have more, if there are any dollars at all, then I'm going to out, I want to output something. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, sorry, dollars comma n. So I will take the value in dollars and I will print it out and I will add a space between it but I won't let Python do a new line. Okay? Now, so if I look at the console, that's what it is here. And now I want to know if I should print out dollar or dollars. And um, I've there's only one dollar, so I'm just going to print out dollar, so I have one dollar. And now I'm going to do the same thing with quarters. I'm going to say quarters greater than zero, so I have some quarters, and I do. Then I'm going to print quarters, so whatever quarters is, so there are two quarters. I'm going to say if quarters is the same as one, which it's not, then I would print the singular, but I'm going to go down and print the plural. Now here's one thing that I haven't touched on yet, and I'm going to touch on it really big right now. You can nest your if statements. You can nest if and elif. So how that happens is my first if statement is left justified. And in this case, I'm working with dollars. So the only thing I care about in here is dollars. And then I have tabbed once my first print statement. But I don't need an elif here. What I need is I need to know if I have one or more dollars. So I'm working with dollars. I have some dollars. That's what line 15 says. So I'm setting it up. Okay, I have dollars. So do I have a single dollar or do I have multiple dollars? And that's what I check in the if and else statements here. So these are called nested if statements or nested branches, and they're nested because they are inside of another if, elif, or else statement.
statement. And you can nest things as many times as you want. Um, my recommendation is if you're nesting three, four, and five deep, that you kind of take a look and see if your code is structured right. But that's how you do a nested if statement, and they are very, they're, they're completely legal, they're fine, everyone does them. So does anybody have any questions about nested if statements? I know that Zybooks talks about them, but I wasn't sure if... Um, Yes, that is completely right, Kevin. So, um, I'm not going to do these. These are just with different numbers, so we're following the numbers, unless people really want to go through it. And I'm doing that because it's after 10 o'clock. But then I thought we would go through the labs, and this is the last week I'm going to be providing, oh, let's see, Yes, you can have an if within an if within an if within an if within an if ad infinitum. But if you're really getting, if you're getting five, six, ten if nested if statements, you probably want to go back and see how your code is structured. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it's something to evaluate. So yes, you can have an if within an if within an if. This is the last lecture I'm going to have flowcharts starting. Next week, I will only have pseudocode. And I'm doing that partly because the flowcharts get very complex and they're really hard to show on a slide. So lab 3.11, let's go back and look at what that is so I can read it. I should have copied it out there. Okay. So lab 3.11, it's saying write a program whose inputs are three integers and who outputs the smallest of the three numbers. So I have, if I have 7, 15, and 3, it's going to output 3 because that's the smallest number. So how do I do that? Well, how I do that is I have a couple of decisions to make. So somebody's going to input an integer. It's going to input a second integer, and it's going to input a third integer. So we just got three ints. we got to check. So here's where you have to use a compound if statement. It says if num1 is less than or equal to num2, true or false, and num1 is less than or equal to 3, then you know that num1 is the smallest number. If both of those statements do not evaluate to true, because it's an and, then I'm going to check if num2 is less than num1 and num2 is less than or equal to num3, if both of those evaluate to true, then we know num2 is the smallest of all three numbers. Um, if none of those, if that if and the second if statement do not evaluate to true, then you know that num3 and by the way, this is one of those statements um, where you probably want to use an LIF. So if we go look at the pseudocode, pseudocode can be a little bit, especially with long uh, programs, as the programs are definitely going to get longer. Um, it can be easier to look at it as pseudocode. But understand, Pseudocode is not code. You can't just type that into Python and have it work. It is a logical representation of what needs to happen in your code, but it is not tied to a given language. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have three inputs. We know how to do that. We've done that for two weeks. Now I have this if statement. This is it first is less than or equal to second. And I've got the little bubble here that tells you where to look up those relational operators. And first is less than or equal to third. So this is a compound if statement. Both of those things, the things to the left-hand side of and and up to the right-hand side of and have to evaluate to true. If both of those evaluate to true, then we know that 
first is the smallest number and we don't have to do anything else. Well, how do we assure we don't have to do anything else? By then using an ELIF for the next test. So it relates IF and ELIF together and assuming the IF statement completely evaluates to true, Python won't even look at the rest of the stuff. Um, if the if first is not the smallest number, then we're going to evaluate second, just the same way we did first, except we're going to do um, second is less than or equal to first, and second is less than or equal to third. If that evaluates true, then you're going to output second. Otherwise, you're going to output third. So um, lab 3.12. This is a big, big lab, and actually I'm not even going to go through this. I'm going to go through this, okay? This is the biggest program you will write, so you will have written so far, and it requires nested if and elif statements. Is anybody asking questions? I don't think so. So let's check. Okay, no questions. So. I have two things. I have a month and a day. And I have lots of if and elif statements. And this looks very confusing, but you can break it down into very logical steps. What we have to do here is we have to determine what season a month and day are in. So if I have the month of January and the day of one, then they're winter. Now, there are a couple of things we have to do here as well. We have to check validity of the day. If somebody puts on a day of minus 99, that's invalid. You don't have any months with a day that is minus 99. So we have to do two things here. We not only have to check the month, but we also have to check that the day is valid for that month. So. And what do we know? Well, we know that in January there are 31 days, so we would want to make sure that the day is greater than zero and the day is less than 31, um, and the month equals January. If all of those evaluate to true, then we have winter. February is the same way except with different days. Now, March is different because March spans winter and spring. So instead of having this nice little long statement here, I'm going to break it up. I'm going to have an ELIF statement. And by the way, these are ELIFs because they're all starting out dealing with months. So they're mutually exclusive. If the month is not January, then we're going to check if the month is February. If the month is not February, we're going to check that it's March. So if the month is March, I now have to break it up by day. So if it's greater than zero and it's less than or equal to 19, then I'm still in winter. Otherwise, if it's less than, if it's greater than 19 and less than or equal to 31, I'm in the spring. Otherwise, it's invalid. You put in a zero, you put in minus 99. And this is the way you go through any month with, that they have defined that spans, that there are some days in the month that are in one season and some days that are in the month that are in another season, you have to format it like this. It will be ELIF month equals whatever that month is, and then you're going to have an IF, ELIF, and ELSE statement all dealing with the day. Now, you're going to put the ELSE statement there because you want to tell them if they put in the wrong day. This will go, this is how it will go all the way through this program. The last thing you're going to have is an else statement left justified, like all of the major ones for the month are, because, and then you're going to print output invalid. That's because they might have put in, you know, um, um, pink glass for the month, and you put in pink glass for the month, that's not a month. So you have to catch the validity of it. Okay. Lab 3.13 is our change lab. And somebody's going to input a value. And that value is going to be something, some positive value. And what we're going to do is what we did 
in floor.py, but on a larger scale, because we have to know how many uh, dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So the first thing I do is I check the validity. I say if input val is less than or equal to zero, output no change. You can't get change from zero or less. And then the program ends. Um, otherwise, we're going to set num dollars, num quarters, num dimes, num nickels, and then num pennies. After we do that, we then have to evaluate the um, values for dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies to see if there's one or more than one. And that's what we do with the if statement. If num dollars greater than zero, output num dollars. If num dollars is equal to one, output dollars, then else output dollars. We did all that in floor.py. I think that's it. Sorry I kept you over. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, I think I just made a, a mistake on my pseudocode. Let me look. Okay. Okay. Whoops. Okay. Let me look. August. Uh, oh, you're right. That's val That's invalid. So I will fix that August is in winter. Um, December is okay to be in winter. I'll fix that. Thank you for catching that. Um, uh, I would not recommend to use or, Kevin. Um, I would really recommend breaking it up like this because if you start using or for the different months, it's going to become very complex and it's going to become harder to manage. It is not always better to put as many decisions on a single line as possible. A, it can get really hard to read and B, it can get really hard to read. So oftentimes what I will do is unless there's a real need to have everything on a single line of code, and sometimes there is, sometimes you're going to have these long compound if statements. Um, if there is a way to logically break them up so they are not difficult to read, I will do that. Um, I, uh, Karina, I will be um, posting the presentation tomorrow on my YouTube channel. So, no problem. Does... Um, You should be able to resubmit it without a problem, Kevin. So, does anybody have any other questions? I'm glad it was helpful, Jocelyn. Um, so, if nobody has any other questions, I'm going to uh, stop the recording. I'm going to stop the um, session, and I will post this tomorrow. So everybody have a good evening.